Arguably the most fundamental rule in the universe is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And generally speaking, if you are more massive, you're going to have a much bigger cap on your top speed and energy. But what happens when things go above this cap anyways? Hi, I'm Seti, I'm a PhD student in astrophysics, and today we're going to be covering the Cosmic Ray, or GZK, paradox. This is part one on my mini-series on astronomical paradoxes. Check back in two days' time for part two. Sure, lights and even neutrinos are quite speedy, but they have it easy in my opinion. They weigh little to or practically nothing, even really high energy lights such as gamma rays. Although they can be quite dangerous to us, they're very easy to make. The sun has been making them for 5 billion years and will continue to do so for even longer than that. But to energise something just a little bit more hefty, say a single proton, to even just a fraction of the speed of light, that takes a lot of skill and energy. That takes something like a supernova, an active galactic nucleus, or, or even a gamma ray burst. These ultra high energy particles are called cosmic rays. They travel at relativistic speeds, meaning close to the speed of light, and they have a wide range in energies. But the most high energy ones we detect are suspected to be of extra galactic origin, meaning they come from outside the Milky Way, way off and far away in the universe. Now to go about actually creating these cosmic rays. We don't have the fine details, but we do have a really good range of ideas. One suspect is active galaxies, specifically their core where the supermassive black hole, as it is feeding, is quite literally liberating energy from mass. Active galaxies are one of nature's most efficient engines. However, despite that, the accretion power of an AGN is probably only just enough to actually create some of these high energy particles. Another theory lies within these peaceful looking images of galaxy superclusters. Now galaxies within these clusters lose a lot of mass to the space between them called the intracluster medium. This creates a superheated environment full of ionised gas and plasma. Two ideas, one of which is that cosmic rays can be produced by shocks within this plasma, which given the energy of such an environment can be really powerful. The second idea comes from synchrotron radiation, which is from magnetic fields within the plasma and the intracluster medium, which can accelerate charged particles such as protons up to relativistic speeds. These ultra-high relativistic particles can't travel faster than the speed of light, which puts one cap on their top speed, but even if they were to dodge every single galaxy or bit of dust and gas as they reach Earth, there is one thing that they cannot escape, and that is the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. When a cosmic ray, let's say a proton for example, interacts with a CMB photon, so light wave or particle, they combine to produce a delta plus baryon. Now that is a baryon that is the exact same in terms of quark number as a proton, so it kind of looks a lot similar to a proton, but it has a much higher mass. But this delta plus baryon isn't very stable, so it very quickly decays into a pion and either a proton or a neutron depending on conservation of charge. But this process caps the maximum energy this newly created particle can have, capping it to about 50 exa electron volts, which is very massive for a single particle. But that is only about 8 joules, which is like less than the amount of energy in a tomato. This limit is called the greisen zatetspin kutzmin limit, which states basically that no observed particle should ever have an energy exceeding 50 exa electron volts, right? We should never be able to detect anything above that limit, right? No, of course not. We wouldn't have a paradox if that were the case. The highest recorded energy of a single cosmic ray particle is the oh my god particle, which was measured to have a whopping 300 exa electron volts, still less energy than a tomato. This is the GZK or cosmic ray paradox. These particles are seemingly disobeying the laws of special relativity, which as far as laws of physics go are probably the most unwavering in my opinion. In order to actually travel at the GZK limit, a particle would actually need to travel at 2 times 10 to the minus 20% below the speed of light, which is a very very small 
gap within that and believe me it really is but in order to actually supply supply the particle with the energy to actually make up that gap you would need to be supplying it with loads and loads more energy energy more than any process within the universe has and thankfully we've never seen a particle even come close to closing that gap otherwise we'd be in real big trouble so how do we actually go about solving this paradox well we have three main working ideas First of all, the GZK limit assumes that the cosmic ray in question is a single proton. And while that is true 90% of the time, it can also be something much heavier, like a nucleus from an atom. The current technology that we have can't really di uh, differentiate between these different types of cosmic rays very well, so that is definitely a really good possibility. Secondly, it is entirely possible on the topic of equipment that our equipment just isn't sensitive enough to detect these super high energies. In order to actually get a really good measurement of the properties of a cosmic ray, it's ideally best to be able to capture as much of that particle's trajectory as possible, meaning you need a really big detector to be able to do so. For example, IceCube, a neutrino detector in the Antarctic, has a surface area of about a kilometre squared. Another idea is that these particles weren't actually created outside the galaxy. They were created quite close or nearby through some unknown event, meaning you wouldn't need to evoke the GZK limit in the first place. Now, in order to actually check that this is correct, ideally we'd be able to see a, an event such as a gamma ray burst that lines up with, you know, the detection of light, the detection of neutrinos, and also the detection of cosmic rays. However, we haven't been able to see something like that that has aligned all three of these messengers so well. So that one might not be as big of a possibility as the prior two ideas. Personally, that's the way that I'm leaning towards. It's probably just an issue with our equipment and perhaps maybe our assumptions about cosmic rays might just need a little bit more updating. But that wraps it up for the GZK Paradox. I hope you learned something new and found it as interesting as I did. Check back in two days time for part two and if you like this kind of content then I highly recommend you subscribe.